So I thought long and hard about what I was going to call this new segment, segment, segment? That's that sand on the floor of the ocean, segment. <laughs> yes, I am deb debuting, deb debuting, debuting, I'm debuting a new segment. <laughs> so I was thinking long and hard about what to call this new segment on my channel. Uh, at first I decided to call it Screening Room, but then I realized that a couple of other YouTubers and a few other people elsewhere on the internet are using that same title for their own various projects. Uh, and then after going through a couple of other rather lame titles that I'd just as soon not mention to you, uh, I decided to settle on Audiovisuals because it's about music, which is where the audio part comes in, but it's visual medium like books or videos. So Audiovisuals it is. Greetings one and all and welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. Yes, I am kicking off a new segment on my channel, although it's not new in conception necessarily. See, I've always had it uh, in the back of my mind ever since I started my channel three and a half years ago. It's always been my intention to have a recurring, occasional, every once in a while segment on my channel where I talk about a music-related book or a music-related DVD or Blu-ray that I have in my collection, and I have several examples of both media in my library, along with the myriad CDs, LPs, and cassettes that I also have. But uh, I never seem to get the chance to do it. I never seem to, seem to have the time, and I think Backtracks was the main culprit. As much as I loved doing that uh, feature and bringing it to you every month, it was a huge time suck, and it really didn't leave any time at all for me to do well, anything beyond the stuff that I brought you every month uh, back then. So now that that's uh, on the shelf, so to speak, for a while, uh, it's freed up, freed up a whole bunch of time that's been uh, allowed me to do some uh, more interesting, you know, varied content for you guys. And so I decided what better time than the present to kick off this segment, which I am calling Audio Visuals. Clever title, huh? Now, when it comes to the print content I might show you over the course of this feature, it could be a pictorial or reference book about music. Those may be the more likely options, frankly. Or it might be a fiction or non-fiction work about music. However, when it comes to the visual content, the DVD or Blu-ray, it could be a music video collection or a concert film, or it could be a scripted comedy or drama about music, or it might be a documentary, as is the case with today's inaugural edition of audiovisuals. In this case, the documentary I'm going to show you is The History of Rock and Roll. Perfect title for the first uh, spotlight in this feature. Now, this is a 10-episode docu-series, which was originally produced in 1995. It was first shown on the Primetime Entertainment Network, which must have escaped my attention. I don't ever recall hearing of that before. But it was also later rerun on VH1 and TLC. And then, of course, it was, as you can see here, packaged in a DVD set for retail. Now, most of the show examines the history of rock and roll in chronological order. It starts out with the very, very beginnings, the roots of rock and roll, and works its way on up through uh, the end of the punk era and the beginning of hip-hop and grunge music right around the early 90s. Uh, but there are some topical detours of sorts here and there. Uh, for instance, one episode looks at the history of soul music and its relationship with rock and roll. And there's another episode that uh, kind of takes a, a detour, a temporal detour again, by looking at the electric guitar, the hist history of the electric guitar and its role in the genre of rock and roll. Uh, there's also an episode uh, that deals with folk music and how it intersected with rock. So yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of different uh, takes that they do. As I said, the, the majority of the episodes take a chronological look uh, over the history of rock and roll. Now, the series features interview clips with dozens of the most popular musicians from the 50s onward. Jerry Lee Lewis, Quincy Jones, Gladys Knight, Bruce Springsteen, B.B. King, Chuck D., and the list goes on. Now, since this is, of course, a documentary series about the history of popular music, as you can imagine, it has a bunch of great performance clips from a multitude of artists from throughout the second half of the 20th century. And it also even has some vintage film footage uh, some of which is quite hilarious, and some of which can be a bit disturbing, too, at times. Uh, although the disturbing footage really uh, limits itself to episode two, just, just to let you know, just as a heads up. But yes, a bunch of great archival footage in there, as well as contemporary uh, interviews with a multitude of uh, popular music luminaries. 
Now, since this series was made 25 years ago, it only covers up until just after hip hop has gotten off the ground. So if that's your favorite era of popular music, you're going to be out of luck, unfortunately. Uh, but as its title implies, it really does focus on rock and roll anyway, and the very closely associated genres. And this, I gotta tell you, is an invaluable resource for anyone wanting to learn about the history of 20th century popular music. Now, I didn't even know about this miniseries at all. I didn't even know it existed until I found the DVD set during Borders Books and Music's going at a business sale. It must have been, I think it was 2011, so it's been 10 years ago. And so yes, I've had this set in my library for 10 years. I must have watched it six or seven times all the way through, but I never get tired of it. I, I can watch it again even right after I finished watching it once. It is just that entertaining and that uh, interesting. Now, this DVD set, unfortunately, is currently out of print, although I have seen it uh, used in stores and online as well. It can go for a bit of a premium, but uh, I paid, I think it was $40 for it uh, in the Borders Going at a Business Sale. But to be honest with you, if I had known ahead of time how entertaining and informative it, was, it is, I would have paid $60 or $70 for it. But then, of course, that's just me. But uh, if you want a taste of it, Well, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and the blues, naturally, was a huge part of my life. The blues and jazz were both, uh, uh, if, if it hadn't have been for, the, for black Americans, we would be doing the minuet and dancing on our tippy toes. Same old blues, but what we did, we took Boogie Woogie that black people was playing all the time, and we put it, the blues and the Boogie Woogie together, rock and roll. See, rhythm, rock and roll is nothing but rhythm and blues up-tempo. And rhythm and blues up-tempo is boogie-woogie. Nowadays, the people have schools that they can go to and study all this music, but in those days, we had records. And you know, all over the world, people used to collect those records. I mean, the people that we work with on Atlantic Records, for example, were from Turkey. And they came here with, with, with a knowledge already of what was happening here because they were able to get these records. And in those days, those records were like gold. And there was an anti-rock and roll feeling in the city if such a thing could happen. But truly, the police, the church, the city governments uh, had a, a great reluctance to allow rock and roll to appear in dances and on the radio. Because what Presley did and what Little Richard did is for the first time ever, there was a division in music that what the parent listened to, the kid didn't necessarily listen to. And we were selling records like we could not believe. This rock and roll rhythm is filled with dynamite and we don't want the dynamite to go off in the Roosevelt Stadium in Jersey City. What do you think of the mayor of Jersey City going on? I think he's a square, man. He don't know what's happening, that's all. Because rock and roll is cool, you know? Yeah, I see. I think that man must have been nowhere because rock and roll is cool, daddy, and you know it. Rock and roll is the most, and if they stop that, they ain't gonna have no more music. Not only was it a way for the Afro-American to speak his mind, but the general public, and the white man in particular, was very frightened of this because of all the old myths about black sexuality and the fear of the integration of the races. At the time in the 50s, most parents didn't want their children, and this is mostly a white uh, frame of mind, influenced by black music. It was very frightening to them. And when guys like Jerry Lee Lewis and Elvis Presley got involved in it, it got even scarier because they figured, okay, well, if only black people were doing it, then I can somehow separate it. But when Elvis showed up on Ed Sullivan <laughs> and the kids who were home were watching it over the TV dinners just after uh, you know, Mickey Mouse Club, the parents realized that music was a very, very powerful tool, and they also realized that this would be something that most kids would absorb into their own culture. Scared the hell out of them. We were behind the curtain at the St. Mary's Ballroom in Putney, and we warmed the audience up. The stones were about to go on, and Keith Richard was limbering up. He was kind of getting down on his knees and getting his blood going. And one of the things that he did is he went like that with one arm and like that with the other arm. And as he was doing that with the other arm, the curtain opened. And he continued to do it as the curtain opened. So for about a year, I thought I was just copying my hero. Literally just copying. Anyway, I then saw the stones two or three times more and Keith wasn't doing it. And I went up to him and I said to him something like, do you mind that I 
copied, you know, your arm swinging technique. And he looked at me like I was a germ, and I realised that he didn't remember doing it. So uh, I kept it in my act. Sorry, MTV, but I've got to tell people this. I'm in New York. It's 1981. I get a phone call. Don Letts, we want to interview you. You're the man who makes the Clash videos. Fine. I go to MTV. I show up in the offices. Everyone's looking at me funny. You know, like I should have used the tradesman's entrance or something. Somebody comes down, calls me into an office, sits me down and says, <clears throat> Don, you have to um, understand that uh, we have a little problem here. What the guy was about to tell me is he didn't realize I was black. He went on to tell me that at that time, the policy of MTV was to cater to a Midwest white audience. Therefore, they weren't really playing black videos. He even gave me an example of how strict this rule was. He cited a wordy rapping hood, which was a, a cartoon, it was an animation video. But he said, that sounds too black, so we don't play that. What Eno and I found that was the most interesting aspect of the new music that we were doing at that time was actually working with synthesizers but throwing the manuals away so that we had no idea how the damn things worked. And it was the mistakes that they made that we found more interesting than the stuff that they were supposed to... Because these things are programmed by high-tech buffs who really don't have any sensibility of what can be done musically, so they put in the stuff that they believe musicians would want to use. And that's the stuff that you really don't want to hear because it's like fake strings and things like that. So if you got, get the wrong circuits going, you get all these crackles and farts coming out of these things. I mean, it just produces the most extraordinary sounds and different range of textures. Most of the musicians I know, you know, their work is it's at the core of their identity. It's what they, a good deal of what they created their identity from. You know, it's fundamental to you. You feel like it is you, you know. And so when you step into that, the mass cultural arena, uh, like I said, there's, there's, if there's a real element of you're on dangerous ground, you know? At the same time, I always, I always thought that that was where you found out what you could do. That type of success is very, very, is, is stressful on you, you know? It's very stressful. And because you're constantly, you feel yourself, you think you feel yourself slipping away in some fashion. You know, maybe you're not. Maybe you are, you know? I have noticed that at least one YouTuber, a, ch a channel called More Music Shows, has uploaded all 10 episodes. Uh, they've got them on a playlist, which I'll link to in my description below. But fair warning, since the series, as I mentioned, does contain a lot of performances of popular songs, a lot of sections of the episodes are going to be muted, so you're going to miss out on some audio. But hey, I, I would recommend that you seek this out. Uh, if you want to learn about where popular music came from, dig deep down into the roots of it, uh, this is the show for you, honestly. It's only 10 hours, so it's not a huge investment of your time. And it's, as I said, I've just derived so much knowledge that I didn't know about before, about where popular music came from and rock and roll and all that stuff. Uh, it's just been so fun and entertaining to watch. I've mentioned that already, but I can't help but say it again. Uh, it's even compelled me to check out some earlier musicians that I'd never bothered to before, such as Ruth Brown, Big Joe Turner, Carl Perkins, and many others. So yes, as, as if you couldn't tell, I am just nuts about this show. I, I would, uh, you know, if, if I wouldn't get in trouble, I would burn copies of this on DVDs for all the people I know. It's just that entertaining. And yeah, I would recommend seeking out a copy of it uh, if you've got a little bit of money to play with. If you uh, are obsessed with music, if you are really uh, passionate about music, whether or not you really know where music came from, the history of it, this is just so much fun, and a lot of fun for the uh, the interview clips, a lot of music, I mean, just about anybody you've ever heard of from 1995 and earlier, uh, it pops up somewhere throughout the course of this show. So yes, fantastic, wonderful stuff. I can't say enough about it, and I'm repeating myself, so I might as well stop here. So anyway, that'll do it for my inaugural edition of Audio Visuals. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends. And give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comment section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the links to my Twitter and Instagram feeds, and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. 
and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.